Okay, there it went. Okay. Um, what I want to do is kind of is, is talk a little bit about uh, resilience for a moment and talk about um, uh, the problems that are, we, that are confronting resilience planning in not only the US, but around the world. We'll go through that in a, a few minutes and then describe this uh, uh, kind of a concept and, and method that we developed around something called the plan integration for resilience scorecard and how we've used it. Um, and I'll talk about some research projects that we've been involved in, as well as actual, we've converted it to actual applications to uh, multiple cities um, and uh, along, the, along the coast in the US, uh, as well as uh, other places, uh, notably in the Netherlands. So when I talk about resilience, there's tons of definitions out there, I realize it. I'll talk about it from the perspective of somebody that does urban and environmental planning. And we think, it's, we think it's trying to build the capacity of the entire community to look ahead, to anticipate, and you need good science, good data, good technical information, and then to put, not just have the data, but then to create a plan to, to, to be able to begin to adapt because you know adversity is happening, either a shock like a hurricane or, or a nuisance event, a stressor like a sea level rise. And then, to, to, and then once you go through these, um, kind of events is not just build back, bouncing back, but it's actually bouncing forward, transforming your city uh, to something healthier, less vulnerable and more equitable. And that's hard to do unless you're kind of ready and planning for it and then integrating what you learn as you go along. If you have good monitoring and good, uh, a good commitment in terms of the people that are in, involved in guiding growth and development in the city. I just want to say, I think there, there are some really big challenges when we start talking about resilience and, and cities. Well, we're, we're knowing more, but we seem to lose more. You know, we're getting better maps, more refined forecast, hazard maps, better forecasting about what's going to happen in the future. We're better at emergency management, getting people out of the way in the event, but yet we're still growing in disaster losses. And if you look at this chart that was put out by NOAA, uh, I think between 2016, 2019, those four years um, were, were the highest in the, in the last 39, 40 years for over a course of four decades in terms of the number of billion dollars, billion dollar events that's controlling for the consumer price index. So we keep, you know, we're doing more, we're getting better science and data and all the why, you know, we're, we're, we're building more with a tremendous amount of growth in dangerous locations. And on top of that, we're uh, uh, exacerbating that issue of loss and risk is this whole notion of the Anthropocene. It's dominating the geophysical forces on the planet, uh, climate primarily, human, human activities doing this. And you know, we're undermining the basic building blocks of civilization um, when we start uh, uh, the, uh, the earth systems that are being compromised. And so if you look at building in dangerous locations, um, ignoring climate, in case of sea level and number of severe um, hurricane events, these kinds of things, we're experiencing more and more loss. At the same time, we're, we're seeing a wealth gap. And that wealth gap can be defined in a number of ways, race, class, these kinds of things. But we're just seeing a, a, a deep, deep divide in this country. And it's something that's troubling and we need to really um, uh, deeply address. And I know Norfolk is deeply involved in this, these type of issues. There's also, I think, growing social polarization. Okay, we all know that. But I won't talk about national. I'll talk about even within a community. And I want to, um, within a communities, we're seeing this. Uh, even within our own city agencies. And I want to harp on this because this polarization um, is affecting the way we plan. And uh, what, I, what I will say is that um, uh, what we're seeing in terms of planning and polarization is that communities are adopting a growing number, uh, number of plans. In the 35 years I've been in the urban planning business, I've seen a proliferation of plans um, that are increasingly specialized and siloed. And what you get is you, you have the standard comprehensive plan of the city, which has legal authority. Um, it's hard to implement a zoning ordinance without a plan backing it up. 
you have to do the due process, you have to collect the data, engage public, and so on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's been kind of the hallmark. But what we've seen over the years is that, well, FEMA says in order to get funding for recovery and building in mitigation into recovery or pre-disaster mitigation, you have to have a hazard mitigation plan. Um, uh, you also, uh, the, the HUD saying, if you want affordable housing, you know, HUD in Washington, you have to have something called a consolidated plan for housing, right, to get eligible for funding. You, you other, other states like North Carolina is now saying you got to have a comprehensive plan. Every local government, if they want to regulate private property in any way, shape, or form, this happened in the last legislature, this, uh, legislature you have to have a comprehensive plan. Okay, so on it goes, open space plans. So in many ways, uh, my colleague, Jamie Massinson says, cities, even the smallest places are swimming in plans. And oftentimes they're stovepiped and they work at cross purposes. Um, so uh, just, I'm having a little trouble here. Moving, let me see, if, okay, I can do it this way. So here's a classic case. I was on a National Research Council pa panel uh, or uh, for uh, two years, and uh, our job was to assess what's known on the on the coast. We produced a, a, a book on this, and uh, at NRC, and that we found that uh, one of the things as a planner, I was like, our, our our group got extended for six months because Hurricane Sandy hit the New York, New Jersey area, and so we were up in Newark, and I said, you know, this whole question about more and more growth. In, in, in dangerous locations. Why do we keep doing this? You know, what, what, what's this whole pattern as a planner? What's going on? So I looked at this. This is one typical New Jersey community on the coast that was flattened the coastline by, uh, by Hurricane Sandy. T -t -t Tremendous losses. If you look at their hazard mitigation plan, you'll see on the left, the area in blue qualified for severe repetitive loss funding for buyouts, right? Because they were, um, uh, because of the uh, of, of, of frequent flooding. It's also in the 100 year floodplain. And the 100 year is a lot wider than it was in this map, but this is a 2012 plan when they redid the maps for the floodplains. But, and you look on the right and you see the comprehensive plan, you say, wait a minute, the areas in purple, if you see there are waterfront redevelopment districts. The downtown in Tan is a, uh, 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 is what they wanna do to these areas is and they do in the plan. They put in tax abatements for encouraging development. They're investing in infrastructure, complete streets, pedestrian-oriented sidewalks. They're raising the densities for allowable developments. They're mixing the uses. They're doing all kinds of stuff that we call smart growth in my field, but maybe it's smart growth in dumb locations. It's the exact same places, the exact same place if you look at the two maps, but in conflict. So. Uh, I look at Norfolk and what Norfolk was trying to do, this is something really cool. Um, I know it's kind of a, it, it, a little bit, it was pie in the sky, but the planners I talked with, Paula Shea and uh, Homewood, the former director there, they're pretty serious about it, about moving ahead with the concepts shown on this map. Um, the, the yellow area is a retreat area. And uh, this is in the copy, the new comprehensive plan for Norfolk. They're kind of uh, working some of these things through, from what I understand, and they um, these areas experienced frequent flooding. The yellow areas, so they want to do gradual retreat. They want to do housing buyouts as as they qualify. Use FEMA funds, maybe use parks park planning funds. These kinds of things, maybe do mitigation banks for wetlands if you want to restore. Um, and they're trying different things. They also do not want to ex expand infrastructure, sewer, water, roads, that kind of thing. And then they have the green areas, which a, a, a worry, particularly in North Carolina, is if you if people get bought out, and we're doing a lot of buyouts in this state, where do they go? I lose my tax base. I'm going to decline in population if I have significant buyout efforts. So maybe I create places for people to go. And the green areas are well; they're higher elevation. They have potential. They're, what if you raise the densities, mix the uses, walkable neighborhoods, create kind of a high quality urban, uh, livable urban setting, right? And uh, there is room for growth in there, particularly infill and redevelopment. So they're kind of trying to gear that up. But other places like in the red areas, 
you know, that's the seat, that's the port, maybe the downtown. You can't start moving that stuff. That's like high value infrastructure and, or high value investments. There it's worth building levees or seawalls or what have you, you know, to invest in the expense. But you can't, you know, building in low area floodplains is getting too expensive. Even the Dutch now are moving away from that. And they're starting to kind of do the retreat, do more land use oriented kinds of strategies, rely on that. So given all this, you know, we, we uh, uh, have been supported by, uh, I don't, it should have DHS, Homeland Security and NSF, a series of grants over the last six, seven years we've had. And uh, kind of if I put a, pull them all together, we said, well, we want to spatially evaluate the degree of coordination of these local networks of plans work at the neighborhood scale. You know, Norfolk is trying to pull things together, you know, the different plans together to make these different zones work. Where, you know, um, a place like the New Jersey coast, that one community is going in different directions. So can we actually put some rigor to this and actually develop a, meth a methodology with metrics to actually measure the actual level of coordination these networks of plans are? And, and the investment strategies backing them. Uh, we also wanted to look at how well they target the most physically and socially vulnerable locations. Um, sometimes you can have, and, and it is, you can have some places that are underinvested and highly vulnerable. And I'll talk about that more. And we also, uh, as we evolved, um, wanted to take this work and actually translate it to practice. And we've been working with uh, multiple communities along the Gulf and Atlantic coast um, and actually translating it to practice. And I'll talk about that in a moment. So what is this thing, this plan integration for resilient scorecard? Well, basically as a research project, we said, you know, the first thing we need to under understand is where are the hazard zones? I know my engineering and hydrology co co colleagues kind of cringe about drawing lines on maps because there's so much uncertainty, particularly after living in, uh, after Hurricane Harvey, you know, the 500 year flood plain was blown away by Harvey. I mean, it was all, it's very iffy about where these flood plains are, but we do work with lines and in planning, we need lines on a map. And uh, we, so what we decided was, well, you know, well, we can we can use regulatory of, of flood plain maps, uh, as well as you could use surge penetration maps, past historical events of a whole variety of things. But you want to delineate the hazard zone and you want to delineate the districts the neighborhoods in the city, right? And uh, uh, so we try to, in this city here, that was phase one, is this plan integration resilience scorecard. The second phase is, well, what's the vulnerability inside these neighborhoods? And you could look at physical vulnerability, you could look at social vulnerability, you could look at ecological vulnerability. And we've tried to develop metrics for these different vulnerabilities. We haven't developed them, we've relied on people that are much more expert at these things than, than we are. Um, but the third phase is what we really do is they say, we try to come up with a score um, to, to look at each of these districts, these district hazard zones and say, well, is it, if it's uh, the score would be, are the plans working against each other or are they, or are they actually increasing risk in, in, in hazardous locations? And if you look, for example, that bright red spot, that's a downtown of this North Carolina coastal city under phase two, that is the most physically vulnerable. But if you score the plans, um, you'll see it's a light pink, the brighter the red, the pink and the red are actually increasing vulnerability. The long range plans wanna do like that New Jersey city I, I posted. They wanna increase through infrastructure zoning, regulatory investment and these kinds of things and incentives. Um, the area in blue is actually on the phase three is actually the one positive area. And there they use the parks and recreation at land acquisition strategy, the hazard mitigation plan they, they uh, for the buyouts as well as the land use plan in this city all work together to relocate, create a new park space and do a variety of things in a fairly high level of a physical vulnerability location. So as well as social actually. So that's how it works. So we try to look at um, uh, the gaps, conflicts and these kinds of things. And actually when we, it's the stacking the plans together and looking at these different 
district hazard zones. And here you could see transportation plans are typically a really rough ones to deal with because they have so much money and so much political power behind them. They build, build, build. And unless you have compatible zoning, you can build a road on the floodplain and that's a growth shaper. And boy, that goes on in Houston like, 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 a, I don't know, just, it's a, it, it's going a hundred miles an hour there. And uh, so, uh, so this is kind of how we do it. We look at different policy instruments that are built in plans, whether the regulatory, like a zoning ordinance or an investment strategy like land acquisition or infrastructure, or we could look at market incentives, density bonuses, transfer development rights if it's voluntary, uh, tax abatements, these kinds of things. So uh, kind of planning ease, but that's what we try to do. And look how well they're dealing with these hazards, zones, these plans together. And again, so we've done this, we've been looking uh, over the years, we've uh, uh, had these grants and uh, we're working actually in more places now than on the map. Um, we had a five-year study uh, four year looking at the, when we worked in three years of three of those four in the, uh, in the Netherlands, that was very rewarding. And uh, we've got a project going on in China and uh, with some colleagues there. One of our former graduates is moving through that, uh, those cities and working there. So, um, and we're actually now working in um, uh, 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 Arizona on, in Tucson and looking at their urban heat islands and then try to look at how well plans are working together to reduce the heat effect. So uh, another study, which I wanna talk about a little bit, um, we're, we're just, we're about a year and a half into it. It's an NSF CRISP. It focuses on infrastructure. It's an, inter it's an interdisciplinary study. There's three components to it. There's looking at infrastructure networks by civil engineering colleagues at Texas A&M and the damage that was done on these infrastructure networks, the cascading effects from failure of flood control to roadway failure, to loss of access to critical facilities like schools or pharmacies or um, even the barber shop. You have to drive five miles where there's one down the road because the roads failed. And, um, so we try to, we're looking at failure of critical networks of infrastructure. Um, and, uh, but what we're also looking at stakeholder group networks and we're looking at networks of plans. So let me just say, what we're doing is we've done time one, we're looking at networks of plans and we've tried to come up with a comprehensive study of Houston on the different neighborhoods. We've done a, two groups of neighborhoods on a comparative, I'll talk about that. And we try to look at how well those networks of plans address infrastructure, these different types of infrastructure, gray and green. Um, we then say, well, what are the infrastructure failures in these neighborhoods? And then we try to say um, <laughs> networks of stakeholders. We try right, to do well, a lot of interviewing of stakeholder groups. And we try to look at disruptions experienced by the, the different neighborhoods. Uh, we've done surveys. We try to look at then the coping mechanisms the neighborhoods have in trying to recover social networks and whether they've been engaged in redoing the plans, okay, at the neighborhood level. And so we looked at time two then are the plans being re, you know, redesigned and are they sensitive to how the infrastructure has failed? And are they as sensitive, are they taking the data generated by my colleagues or the failures generated in our study, we know where the failures were, the cascading, and are the new plans accounting for that? And are they accounting for the input from the, uh, from the, the, the disruptions experienced by the neighborhoods? So this whole thing is kind of a network of network studies. I'm just gonna focus on the plans. It's a long process where um, we're just now finishing our data collection. So um, on, on the various parts, but Ali Mustaverdi is my good colleague in civil engineering who who's, uh, we're working with is the lead PI, I'm a co-PI. So um, it's a, a five-year study. So we're, we're, we're not even halfway through yet, but the two, we have uh, looked at two sets of neighborhoods uh, um, in Houston. Uh, the east side and the west side. And uh, the west side neighborhoods are uh, uh, low in or high income, low social vulnerability. That means they're low poverty, high, high level of income, highly educated. Um, uh, the, on the right, it's primarily poverty 
uh, low income. Uh, there's a, 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 a racial component to this uh, um, and uh, deeply embedded uh, racial uh, 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 inequity um, and uh, going on here. And there's a long history to it, a legacy, uh, where we see some things that I'll, you'll be revealed in a moment here. So, and these both were equally devastated by Harvey, uh, both these sets of neighborhoods. And so we have 38 districts in the, in the wealthier west side and uh, in the lower income, primarily African-American side, we have uh, 21 districts we've looked at. So what are the scores? Well, um, I'm not gonna go, go through all the indicators for the vulnerability analysis, but basically, if you just say the west side's high income, the east side's low income. Um, and you're gonna see they were both were devastated by the uh, equally in terms of damage, um, um, uh, uh, loss of housing and, 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 and infrastructure. Uh, but uh, what you'll see is the plans are much weaker. The, the red or the pink and the red are very, um, are, are, are low scoring plans, very little attention giving to reducing vulnerability, uh, mitigation, building and resiliency into the plans. And we looked at dozens of plans. Houston's a, a massively big city and growing massively. And, uh, and we looked at uh, the plans on the right side. And you'll see, uh, particularly the 100 year floodplain area uh, where the brightest green are the 100. Um, but you'll just see generally, even as you move away from the green, the brightest green areas, which move, are moving away from the most uh, flooded, uh, most severely flooded exposure. You'll see there's even more attention though given generally across the uh, west side than the east side. If you also look at, um, there is something called redlining. Uh, that's the dark, that's the dark cached area. Um, there's a long history of redlining where uh, uh, after World War II, um, banks in the US decided if it's an African American community, we're not gonna give home loans, VA loans, mortgage loans, and that kind of thing. The, the, the greater the proportion of, of blacks in a neighborhood, the less likely you're gonna get a loan. And uh, we're gonna prioritize. And it's just a long history of, and then there, there were uh, the zoning allowed for a lot of permitted uses com to make compatible with the redlining um, in many cities. Um, Houston doesn't have zoning, but many cities did this. Deed restrictions, uh, lack of infrastructure and investment. So there's a, and this goes on for, uh, you know, you know, decades, uh, centuries, actually, this divestment and the lack of an ability to accumulate wealth when you got these hurdles overcome to overcome. You didn't see that. Now the city has expanded on the east side and it's annexed, but you still see, uh, uh, but, and the redlining was outlawed, banned by the Supreme Court by the, in the 1970s. But that's just a lingering effect. I think it's quite obvious. So what does it look like? Here's a west side neighborhood. And I just picked four plans, my student picked them. You'll see what, uh, what it actually looks like tangibly that um, in the, the regional transportation plan in the west side, in one of these neighborhoods, one of the 38 there, uh, this is typical where you have, uh, they did, they're, they're putting in mass transit, they're putting in, um, uh, uh, an energy inter interchange. And actually that's a big investment when you're putting in transit stops, light rail, that kind of thing in Houston, uh, which is gonna raise vulnerability. So that's not so good, but I'll just give you a feel that they, they get that kind of stuff anyway, that kind of infrastructure. The Harris County Flood Control District, their capital improvement program, they wanna widen and deepen and straighten the Buffalo Bayou, the major major, major drainage uh, basin in, in, in that district, in that neighborhood. The Gulf Houston Regional Conservation Plan, they, they, their, their whole thing is to create, re-restore the riparian corridor along the major bayous in the city. And, uh, and so there's kind of a little tiss if you look at the neighborhood plan, the local neighborhood people want a forested bayou, but the flood control district saying, if you really want to avoid flooding, you're gonna have to have wide and deepening of, of the bayou. The locals call it a, dr a drainage ditch. Um, kind of a pejorative term maybe, but uh, so, but they're gonna get a mix uh, of both. Um, and you can see what the housing looks like and what it looked like after Harvey on the bottom picture there. Here's another place on the east side. 
Um, before Harvey hit, these is what the plans, this is time one for the plans, what they look like. You'll remember there was a lot of red and dark, dark you know, pink and red, uh, very little attention to vulnerability reduction. Um, the transportation plan, they're building a, high cor a highway corridor that's gonna run along, it's gonna be elevated, and it's gonna run along the neighborhood, but there's no investment for a transit stop, there's no investment for an ex exit, or anything. they're not gonna get any economic benefit, just air pollution from it. The flood control district, there's no projects um, uh, identified in this neighborhood. The regional conservation plan, there's no uh, river corridor acquisition uh, programs, and there's no neighborhood plan either. So there's just sort of this long history, and you can see the kid there on the top because it's located, um, you know, there's a, 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 a it's flooded and uh, it's behind one of the petrochemical plants. and. Uh, what stormwater drainage they do have on the bottom there, it's clogged and it's not maintained and the city doesn't do much about it. Um, so this pattern kind of holds, I just, I'm not giving you a whole lot of quantitative here, but I am showing that we've looked at other cities and this pattern shows this inverse correlation. I'm kind of harping on social vulnerability because I think that's kind of signs of our times. Um, it's not just always the amount of dollar damage value or vulnerability from it. It's also social vulnerability. And we'll see a long history of uh, the higher the social vulnerability, the inverse relationship with the strength of the network of plans. Um, and, and that's kind of a pattern, that negative correlation, both in the 100 year and the sea level rise areas of these different cities. One place was good, but um, by and large, that was the pattern. Um, so. That's kind of the negative aspect to it. What I do want to do is kind of talk for the next oh, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes on um, translating the research to practice. So um, we're, we're generally finding that we find conflicts across plans, gaps, um, and opportunities that were unintentional or hidden. It's like I talked before about one community, you know, had a land acquisition strategy for its parks plan, a bio strategy for its hazard mitigation plan, and a land use plan they had in place that regulates development and zoning and land acquisition, or regulates zoning and what you can and can't do on the private property. So they try to pull them together. You know, they this was kind of an un, you know co-benefits produce you know um, mutually work together. So conflicts, gaps, hidden opportunities, that kind of thing. I think the plan integration for resilient scorecard, the information generated, um, we felt like, well, maybe, maybe we can use this in an actual place. And maybe we could, let's, let's examine, and I, we have a paper under review. I'm kind of a quantitative person, empirical, but this was a hard paper to write because we tried to, it's more of a qualitative in the sense that, did we actually build capacity did we improve the expertise of the city agencies that were leading these different plans or county agencies? Did we actually um, increase the social networks, the social capital of these places, their level of awareness of one another's plans as well, so the communication ties? Did these things get improved? Um, and also, what were the outcomes? Did they actually better integrate their plans? Did they get actual public investments or development regulations that come out of it? And uh, so what we did was we created a tool for translating the scorecard to practice and it's on this website. Um, and what we did was we said, well, uh, we're, we wanna work with a series of pilot communities. And uh, uh, we started with three, um, Rockport, Texas, which was flattened by Hurricane Harvey, a low capacity, small place. Um, uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, which is more of an in, inland riverine community city, about 80,000, and Nor Norfolk, we, we had the one high-end, high best practice place um, that we wanted to, so we had kind of a suite of places. And what we wanted to do is find willing partners. So we put out a call through our networks, and we had help from the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA to say, well, what communities would be interested? We had a flood of, of interest. We had way more from California to uh, Pennsylvania on the Delaware River to 
uh, these other places, Nashville and New Hampshire, to Norfolk, to multiple places in Texas and Louisiana. So what we did was we, the places that were willing, and we started one at a time, and Norfolk was our first, we said, okay, you have to create a team and we'll train you. Uh, we'll do webinars, we'll even come up, we had a team come up to Norfolk and we'll run a community workshop um, on how to evaluate your plans because a plan when it's adopted by a city has a constituency behind it. So it's great to see the public or stakeholder groups that, that are behind these plans, you know, willing to, to at least listen and be part of the process and be informed as the city self-evaluates the lead agency uh, uh, team of each, the lead uh, agency for each plan is involved in, in scoring their own plans. So they self-evaluate their plans. So you have investment and ownership in it. And then it's about looking at the, helping us assess the vulnerability. And then we also uh, try to advise on policy solutions. So the comp conflicts, gaps, potential co-benefits. Co we have a serious, uh, a, a team of experienced planning practitioners and uh, doing this type of thing. And the community tasks I kind of went through, they have to contribute staff time. Uh, if you have GIS data available, that's great because this is, makes it a lot easier, participate in training. And again, self-evaluate plans and seek public input, whether it's elected officials or whether it's your stakeholder groups or both, but try to get input so that we can put some legs to the study, not just another study and another publication, we get well known in another grant we like to in the university. So what I'm going to do is just a, a, a talk a little bit about this one, um, the, the, the results of these three cases. And I'm only going to focus on Norfolk because I only have time to do that one. Um, so we use this research model called participatory action research, where we actually worked with the city staff. We at the university did our role as the university experts. And from start to finish, we co-produced the study and the policy recommendations, right? With the city, it wasn't a top-down process where we, th we, we produced the data and we actually produced data, co-produced it and co-produced solutions from start to finish. We used now to track the change. We just didn't wanna kind of walk in with our hands in our pockets and say, oh, we wanna see what happened. There's something called a, a logic model um, they use this a lot in public health and other, um, uh, it's, it's about what, what's your theory of change that you wanna, how, a framework where you wanna see if you do an intervention like a project, what, you know, what, how, how much did it contribute to actually making change in the community? And, and what, who, who, is, who is involved in making the changes um, within the community and what actions did they take? Uh, did they take? And so we also on the side, um, in the three cities did a lot of, um, uh, uh, looked at ordinances and plans and we took field notes. We looked at media uh, surrounding the, uh, the events and we did follow-up interviews and so on to try to gauge well what worked, what didn't and a lot of content analysis. Uh, um, not content, you know, not the scoring of the plans but actually try to look at, try to make sense of the whole process. And this took about two years and we have a paper under review and we'll see. But this is just one part of a logic model for Norfolk. We, we feel like um, we actually increased a lot of co cross-agency coordination and learning. We had a lot of, from the interviewing and the post-project interviewing, we had a, uh, we, we looked at the city officials and uh, we, we, we administered a survey and so on. We tried to say, well, do you feel like you understand the network of plans in your city better uniformly? Did you learn about the values um, driving these plans? What's important? How do the cultures of these different city agencies work? In the case of Norfolk, when they did their last comprehensive plan, they never talked to the emergency management department. The emergency management department had a hazard mitigation plan and they're moving ahead with it. It was never included in the comprehensive plan. That's kind of one example, there are others. Um, so there, there were, so anyway, they, they attempted to, um, uh, uh, so there was some real team building going on and uh, better communication. And there was also public events like uh, presenting it to the, like, to the city uh, council and so on. But as a result, 
um, before they are doing the new plan, I understand in 2021 here in Norfolk, they want to use the results to help them um, in a better integrate their plans as they're producing the comp plan. They want it better linked with the other plans of the city. Um, it's a two way street. You have to kind of to get to work together. They also um, um, are, are approving their coordination of plans. They had 27 amendments um, in the in the plan, the current plan uh, that's there now, not the new one coming up uh, to, to better link, particularly with the emergency with the hazard mitigation plan. And they also created a, a proposal. Um, and they felt like they, since they had their act together, uh, they had confidence they could write a stronger proposal to HUD, Housing and Urban Development, to compete for a resilience award. Because if you're a city and you can demonstrate you have your act together, you're looking into the future, you have a plan and you want to be, you know, you're moving in a positive direction. And they want to, you know, Norfolk to, you're a high profile city, you know, res resilience, heart, Rockefeller 100 when it was around and this amazing uh, uh, award that you got uh, from, from HUD. And uh, the, the award was to build a resilience park. And you know, we actually tracked the process of uh, who was involved in the neighborhood and, and so on and pulling that plan together. And I think it's really cool. And um, I'll just show you the results on the left here the two neighborhoods where that park is going in, uh, when we did their composite score for Norfolk, got the lowest scores, the yellow. Um, and they just, so, and the city realized that and, and said, well, we need to be, do these things and getting a resilience park or getting an award will really help us. Um, there's a long historic legacy to why those scores are so low in Granby and Chesterfield. And, uh, uh, of, of deep disparities and injustices. So I think the city is, is, is on top of it. So um, where do we go from here? And I just say some, some uh, interesting lessons we had uh, working with the three cities, Nashua, New Hampshire and Rockport, uh, Texas as well. It's uh, one of the lessons we really got out of it and uh, was just don't equip people with data. They have to, they have to understand and trust the data um, trusting data and science, <laughs> uh, not just the plan integration work, but the fact that you are sea level, what's going to happen. You're, you know, we, we would try to look at some maps for that and integrate that in. But we tried to help them uh, all the way through to structure the process to help them identify the conflicts, gaps, and opportunities. And we think it, the, the process typically took nine months, 12 to 12 months in each city. Um, the network of plan part was the easy part, you know, that took maybe a couple, that took maybe a week to two weeks of staff time, but it was all the other work that went on. And uh, it's about trying to support a culture of collaboration. We try to find a community champion in each, you know, to lead the way. In the case of Norfolk, it was the planning department. In the case of uh, Nashua, New Hampshire, there's an amazing emergency management coordinator there, management official who, who reached out to the other departments. We tried to make it enjoyable, uh, make it user-friendly, nudge, change, don't shove. Um, uh, and we also tried to say, well, you know, we wanted to, you know, it's a critical not only for the, this in a way was a study, we tried to look at the outcomes of the plan, but what was the performance of, the, of this activity? But also we think it's important to monitor at the neighborhood scale, not just a bus, but in the long run. Uh, our work, but um, for our study, but in the long run, is this making a difference? And are you getting better integrated plans that are uh, working towards a resilient community? So uh, you can see here we're, we're, we're working in Houston and in Houston, we're actually engaging the local neighborhoods and the community organizers. Um, and uh, I've talked about the other places. In Tucson, Arizona, we're doing an urban heat resilience we're starting, we're kind of down the path, pretty far down that path, but we're really gonna start um, earnestly collect, you know, generating data on the resilient scorecard within the city of Houston, in Tucson. And that's been hard because we had the shift from floods and water to, to uh, uh, heat, heat buildup. So the next steps, we were very fortunate because 
this funding has been in part and a very significant part all along. NSF has had, we've had a couple of studies with that, but the Department of Homeland Security, the, uh, the Science and Technology Directorate at a Homeland Security um, has been supporting this, but they've really supported the mission practice type work we've been doing. And uh, it wasn't always get more publications that was actually making a difference. And, and hopefully we get a publication too out of that, the practice engagement part. Um, and what they have done is they're going to take the best practice standard and they're going to market it. And they have all kinds of, and they're going to prevent, present webinars for training. They're going to aggressively integrate it with, they do a lot on resilient cities. It's going to become an integrated tool amongst the tools that they use. And uh, to, uh, you have to be a, a part of the, um, there's a, a certification that you take after you get your master's and worked in the planning field for so long. You have, to, you have to become certified. You're going to get credit if you go through this process and uh, to maintain your accreditation. And there's a lot of chapters and a lot of members. And uh, the whole notion is to build a national cadre. So I think uh, pretty much I tried to keep it to 45 minutes, but um, I'm sort of, uh, I, I think I'm there. I'm, I'm done. Perfect timing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll open it up for questions. Or if you also, you can also uh, type your questions in the chat if you prefer to do to do that. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, this is Jim Holeska. Um, your the studies are on communities that uh, invited you in, basically. Yes. Um, how do you bridge the problem of of not dragging along, but trying to uh, convince uh, communities that, that aren't that don't want to play ball or, or don't want to? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, in our case, we're you know universities, right? You know, we're working. At, it's we don't we're not a state legislature you must mm -hmm. but what we try to do is take willing partners and then seed it and then we develop uh the more we can seed it and seed in terms of uh you know grow the seed water it and then grow it and then help the city bloom and come up with some best practice knowledge codify that knowledge um and if we get enough cases, we can work with the American Planning Association so they have tangible, you know, cases they can turn to with a, there's been actual application. It's a soft power approach. I don't think you can do it where there's resistance. If the city council says no, you know, people don't want to lose their jobs. So, or if there's reluctance on part of resistance on part of city agencies, although, you know, like if you're doing it anyway, if you're, if you want to get money from FEMA, you have to have a mitigation plan. So maybe, you know, there, I mean, there, there's a logic to it in terms of efficiency, I think, and limiting duplication of effort. Um, state of North Carolina just said every local government's got to have a, you know, got to account for this as part of their new, every, everybody's got to do a comprehensive land use plan over the next two years last year and part of this year they've had to redo their regulations to get more coordinated they've been um, but i won't get into the details but in order to for the regulations to have authority the state's saying you have to have a plan um and uh and part of its hazard mitigation um so you know we're gonna we're, our hope is we can maybe leverage this we're working in new Bern, north carolina we want to work with the, those folks there and uh Thank you. Yep, yep. Good Thank question, you. though. That's any, a tough any, question. any other questions from the audience? If not, yeah, I have. I had a question. Uh, I also put it on the chat. Uh, I'm kind of interested in this Norfolk scorecard a little more closely. Is that publicly available at, at for citizens to look at? 
Yeah, I can send you a case study um, of what we've written up uh, that the cities use. There's also uh, the American Planning Association has written it up. Um, I can send you, they, they have it on their website. Um, so there's some material you can talk with uh, Paula Shea, the assistant director of planning. Um, um, she, she can inform you um, in, in the city, so. Um, yeah. yeah, I own a, a property on Willoughby. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but that's out there in that strip. Uh. And uh, I was a little surprised by your map. It seemed to get a relatively good score. <laughs> it's so high density. Yeah. Well, we're not, you know, it could be, we, um, we're only looking at how well the city and the county plans that affect, like the hazard mitigation, affect an area. We, uh, and you could be, you know, highly built up, but if you're doing a lot to mitigate, you'll get a positive score. If you're doing a lot to keep an open space in a dangerous location, to keep it open, like Lee City, Texas did, you'll get a high score. But you have to match it up with a vulnerability too, so. Okay. Uh, I've got, Go got a question, if I could. Mm -hmm. um, so your tool seems very useful for, for planners and, and, and city uh, government, but for those communities who lack influence in city government already, um, how can they use this sort of thing to get themselves planned around appropriately? <laughs> um, because of course the city planners answer to the government, the city government power structure, and they're not going to tick off <laughs> the city government power structure. Well, in the case of, uh, you know, I put those Houston comparisons up that we're working with the uh, 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 two groups called, one's called Charity Productions, a long-term civil rights uh, organization that has deep roots on that side of town and on the Southeast side. We're working with Tejas, Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services. And they're using that information to say, see, you know, you're not giving any attention and you know, we get hit just as hard and worse because of the social impacts, the disparities. We don't have flood insurance, you know, like over on the west side. We don't have, you know, we can't afford, the recovery is gonna go a lot more, you know, uh, a lot slower for us and, and more hardship. So they use it in that way. Um, uh, but that's a pretty stark contrast, you know. Um, but it, they're, they're, you bet they're used, those maps are being used. Um, I've left Houston, but my colleagues there, um, I talk with them next week. I'm talking in a couple of weeks, but I get an update, but they're definitely using. It and seems I, like that would take a, um, an education effort maybe uh, yes. to get the community organizers and activists to uh, you know, to, to make the most out of this kind of tool. Yes, yes. And uh, we're trying to, you know, we're not, you know, the, there's so many different players in all this and the planning department and plan and urban and environmental planners interested in climate and resilient cities and hazards. We're, we're one part of the group, um, but they're also very uh, powerful, other powerful interests you know, regional conservation agencies can have some input. Um, and, and I think the, to get the transportation authorities, you know, interested in this because they're, they're growth shapers um, to get the utilities. I know, in, for example, in Chapel Hill, the utility is independent from the city. So we get the water utility, utility on board and we try to just kind of uh, reflect on um, but this is the politics and it's, you know, I don't have perfect answers, but I felt like we just, as, as, a, as a, our role was, we're in a university, we have a lot of publications. Hey, I have a hundred. How many do you have? You know, I got 200, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, and maybe at this point in my career, starting a few years ago, um, I just 
I, we, I felt strongly that we should engage. And, and uh, it's a little bit of a risk for a young faculty member to go this route, but uh, we need more of it. We need to change the way we educate our students, the way we educate our future faculty to engage, to, you can still publish, you can, I don't know, I'm just trying to tell you about how the little ways that we try to make a change, but it's not overnight. So there's a question um, from the chat asking about, is there an opportunity to use this at the state level? For example, to help integrate state plans as well, or to help states work with cities? We are talking to the state of Pennsylvania next week about just this. And uh, they, we, we wanna, you know, we're hoping that we can get the state um, interested and um, I think at the state scale, it's so broad, I guess you could, we, I, I'd have to, I'm not sure, but if the state could encourage as a tool and then run some pilots within the state um, to show how the tool works and then grow the, grow the uh, seed, seed it. Uh, the state of California, there's a group in California um, that are, that are uh, written into the budget for the state hazard mitigation budget. They got climate there too. There's a group of uh, um, at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, it's a university there, and they do the, the practice work of evaluating the plans, standalone mitigation plans for the state, and they want to use this tool, and they want to have cities kind of account for it and actually train. So, you know, we're, we're getting there slowly, but uh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm hoping you got any ideas? <laughs> we would love at the state level. I would. I. I I'm not. Uh, I think. If we, I guess if we looked at the plan. We could look at the spatial implications of the big plans. Where they want to run the big highways. Where they want to make the major public infrastructure investments. Where they and is the state working together? So I guess you could do it. I'm thinking. But good question. Um, there's another another question that actually I think goes back to one of the earlier questions that was raised um, along the lines of how hard is it to find willing collaborators in communities or groups within government? Yeah, well, I think in the case of Houston, they weren't interested. The city is so huge, a big city like that. So, but if you scale down at the neighborhood scale, particularly where um, uh, uh, we had um, some well-developed, smart people working on behalf of the uh, underserved, marginalized neighborhoods for many decades. So they knew they could see what we were doing pretty quickly. Um, but uh, in that case, I think in Norfolk, when I talked to the planners there, Paula Shea recently, she's all about, she says the two things we're worried about in this city is equity and flooding. You know, the sunny day flooding and the equity, we're so worried about that. So she's kind of a champion in a way, I think, for um, in, in trying to get the cities, to, the city agencies to work together. So you just have to find those champions, that's what we call them, that, that are network builders and can, you know, that can pull people together. You don't want, I don't think you want divisive you know, you want you want to find that the champions in a city that are worried about this, and uh, see they have a long. You have, you have to be persistent. There's a long run, um, kind of angle to this. Maybe not so long if you get hit by you know. Sea level happened pretty quick in Norfolk. I understand. So um, we probably have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. Any last minute questions? I have one more. Go ahead. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the, was it Tucson where you're doing a, a heat island uh, yes. study? How, what's, is there anything available on that? No, uh, uh, we're just starting it. There oh, is a heat oh. island faculty member at the University of Virginia, uh, Professor Bev Wilson. He, okay. he, he's a he, uh, Bev Wilson. He's at the, in the planning department, I think in the School of Architecture. 
and he's doing a lot of heat island mapping in Virginia. I've seen he's a very good at spatial data analysis, and he's looking for, for the hot spots in cities like in Richmond or what have you for vulnerability hot spots, yeah. or urban heat effect. Okay. And I talked with him about the scorecard. Said I don't. Um, a few weeks ago, they got a proposal in for a grant to do work. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, I correspond with uh, Jeremy uh, Hoffman of the Science Museum of Virginia. He's he's done a lot. He he actually had a couple of studies that okay. for Richmond and uh, well, I think he, he he was involved with the NPR study, the country, the top twenty five. Chesapeake was one of the top 25 for uh, urban heat islands. Okay. Um, the only problem there is, is when you look at it, uh, they were doing it by uh, uh, census district. Mm -hmm. And it's some of the things, some of the self suppositions they may break down when you actually look at the contents of the of census districts. But yeah. I mean, you got to start and, somewhere. Yeah, if you're doing social vulnerability, the census helps. but. When you start start drawing lines like flood flood plains and urban heat, you know build uh, you know hot spots. They don't follow the federal jurisdictional lines for the census. No, that's that's yeah. kind of yeah, that's a that's a real bummer too. <laughs> yeah. But I think they would they could probably get around that though the actual heat. Get rid of the census stuff and look at the actual heat patterns. I would imagine they had to generate it some way. But I, I think too, I know I, they get squeamish sometimes about getting parcel level data. Well, this, you know, drawing too fine a line, you know. Well, thank but. you, Phil. It's 432. So I do want to thank those of you who came for the seminar for participating. Um, we will stay on. Um, for a little bit to have more of an informal discussion in Q and A, um, but if people might need to take a quick break in between, please feel free to do so. Um, what I will ask, um, if you are part of kind of this informal discussion conversation, if you have questions or comments to make, if you could please just introduce yourself briefly 